I think we need to grapple more with nuance. I think we're losing a lot of nuance in our political conversations and in our media conversations. And, um, but we need to do that in a way that is easy enough for people to grab onto what they can do. Because I think people will, will despair at the presence of complexity and the absence of any agency. What could go right? I'm Zachary Carabell, the founder of the Progress Network, and I'm here with Emma Varvalukas, the executive director of the Progress Network. And we are wrapping up our third season of What Could Go Right, our conversations with stimulating, atypical, intriguing individuals with distinctive voices, not animated by outrage, not motivated by fear, trying to look at what we are doing in the world to solve the problems we have rather than adding to the cacophonous noise, creating many of the problems that we all know that we have. And certainly coming out of the midterms, which I believe most of us were pleasantly relieved and or surprised, did not amount to the sum of all of our fears. And in fact, in the United States represented, if not a return to normalcy, I mean, after all, what was normalcy has the past few years shown us that what we thought was normal was either anomalous or not quite what we thought but either way uh maybe the beginning of a degree of guardrails around the most extreme antinomian forces threatening to tear us all apart societally a return to or the new beginnings of a degree of consensus that we have to have some consensus about the rules of the game and the road, otherwise everything falls apart. That will be tested again in two years, but for the time being, we can all breathe a collective sigh of, if not relief, then maybe of sanguinity that the world is not on the path of imminent disintegration, at least not the American world. The rest of the world is also proving to be more stable in light of COVID, in spite of the fact that there are wars in Ukraine and famines elsewhere and crises always threatening on the horizon. Uh, one of the things that the recent election shed light on was the degree of election denial and widespread accusations of fraud, which were always mired more in suspicion than in proof. Uh, the voices warning of that and threatening that did not find widespread purchase which means that a degree of both misinformation and disinformation didn't have traction. So we're going to talk to someone today who's been at the epicenter of media and has uh, focused a lot on these very questions about what we do in a world where there is a lot of information and almost by definition, a world with a lot of information is also a world with misinformation and sadly as well, a world with disinformation. So Emma, tell us about our guest today. So today we're going to be speaking with Bina Venkatraman, who's editor-at-large at the Boston Globe. From 2019 to 2022, she was the editorial page editor there, where she led its editorial board and oversaw the opinion section. Previous to that, she taught at MIT's program on science, technology, and society, and also directed policy initiatives at the Broad Institute of Harvard, as well as MIT. She was a senior advisor for climate change innovation in the Obama White House. And before all of that, she was a reporter at The Globe, as well as The New York Times. And she is the author of The Optimist Telescope, Thinking Ahead in a Reckless Age, which was named Best Book of 2019 by NPR, Amazon, and Science Friday. Bina, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, you've been, I think, at the epicenter for the past few years of race in America, climate change policy, media, disinformation, misinformation, and democracy. So clearly you haven't been focusing on the central issues of our day, which is fine. Everybody gets to choose their passions. Um, I think let's focus a little on some of what you've been doing uh, recently uh, and this kind of intersection of, I guess, misinformation and climate and misinformation democracy, right? So you, you've been a, a writer and a, a creator of let's call it media content but you've also been on the other side of the maybe not the fence but you've been more on the gatekeeping side of helping decide what makes its way into media content at least centrally on a on a major platform so what's your 
I guess, take on that given those roles first, right? Particularly on the gatekeeper part. Um, you know, a lot of us, me included, who are in the occasional business of providing content are peripherally aware of just like the fire hose of stuff that comes at platforms. And we're beginning to find some of that even in a smaller form with the progress network. But I'm, I'm kind of interested from you what that, what that did in terms of changing your sense of like that line between information, opinion, and outright misinformation. It's a great question. And uh, there are no neat and clean answers to this problem because I think we're just like sort of at the beginning of really grappling with it, I think, as a society and as media leaders, but as an editor who oversaw an editorial board and the opinion coverage of a, uh, a major paper, as you've said, major platform, the Boston Globe, I think there were kind of two ways in which I was looking at this problem of mis and disinformation. One is, of course, being a responsible gatekeeper, as you call it, or arbiter of credible truth-based, uh, evidence-based opinion in a world where there's cacophony of opinions and anyone can publish their opinions on any topic at any given moment in time on Reddit or Twitter or Facebook or anywhere else. And so the sort of bar of what a journalistic institution or organization does and what kind of opinions or uh, ideas it puts in the world, I think just becomes higher in the world and the ecosystem of information that we exist in. And knowing that, right, these sources of mis and disinformation are out there, that um, they, they're everything from everyday people who are just making kind of innocent mistakes and sharing a post on Facebook about something that they might not understand. Maybe they're afraid of the vaccine. They share some piece of information and they're therefore accidentally spreading misinformation about something. Uh, it ranges from that all the way to sort of major influencers, celebrities, or um, former presidents who put out messages that they might knowingly recognize as false, like that the election in 2020 was stolen or that there was widespread fraud at the polls in Georgia or Arizona. And those kinds of problems, right, are very, very different in terms of how you think about containing them. And and the media is only one part of that sort of problem and solution set and ecosystem. So, um, so this brings me to the sort of second part. So there's the being an arbiter of truth and having really high standards for the grounding of fact when, because opinion, you know, to some degree, there's some flexibility in opinion with, you know, we don't just stick to the facts. You lean out and say what you think, but the, the standard, holding that standard that that should be underpinned by, um, by the truth. Um, and, and then so the second part of it, sorry to jump around here for a moment, is that uh, recognizing that the media is only one part of it and that we exist in this uh, environment where the business models for media have been strained over the past decades, that uh, we have these very um, rigorous and strict paywalls for a lot of news content, including the Boston Globes. And then in other instances, there's very ad-driven content like Breitbart or any number of sites, whether they're on the right or left side of the spectrum, where the content, um, you know, basically gets more attention based on the amount of ideological outrage and um, and the, the amount of um, kind of eyeballs it can it can garner based on its how sensational it is or how relevant it is, depending on how you want to look at that. And and so I think that the other way I've began to begun to look at this problem is just to sort of try to study and understand how do we go about solving the underlying problems that allow people to believe in lies uh, or false statements? How do we go about reassembling, reestablishing some degree of trust, communities that can combat misinformation? Uh, how does that problem get solved? And so more, more as sort of a journalist and as a reporter putting on my sort of writer and researcher hat, I've tried to look at um, where there might be examples of communities that have fought mis and disinformation, or at least where the record has been corrected or where the course has been corrected. So Bina, I'm going to do a perhaps very annoying thing and ask your own question back at you, because <laughs> that's what I want to know is like where the potential pass forward could be. Um, obviously, you know, we're all in the same industry here in the media. And sometimes when we talk about misinformation and what integers of, of news can can do to be able to spot it, I feel like we're almost talking about teaching calculus when we haven't taught basic math. Like when I talk to just friends of mine, like 
they don't know the difference between an op-ed and, you know, straightforward reporting. If I have that conversation about what's the difference, they're like, well, where does it say that it's an op-ed? You know, that we're at that kind of basic level. So I'm really curious to hear, you know, during your, your research and reporting, what you have seen that has worked. You're absolutely right. I mean, I think one of the challenges, one of the things I discovered uh, and diving into this topic a little bit is that there's some research um, done by a Stanford uh, researcher named Joel Breakstone that actually indicates that people are very confused about these sources of content, the delineations between opinion and the news. Um, but even more, I think, um, perilously, people are very confused, particularly looking at high school students who expect to be sort of digitally savvy. They're, they're very confused about the difference between sponsored content, which news organizations, people like me understand, and probably people like you understand to be content that comes from advertisers that isn't subject to the same standards that journalism is subject to. It's sort of motivated by the advertiser's goal to sell you something. They have trouble distinguishing between that and the veritable journalism of a site. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense that people are confused by that because um, we we label it as sponsored content, but a lot of the content resembles uh, news articles or resembles sort of our opinion columns that we post. And so I see a lot of responsibility and what we're learning about um, the sources of confusion and mistrust. I see a lot more responsibility as an editor and as someone who is a leader in media to kind of rethink some of these modes in which we communicate, including that way of communicating that something is opinion versus um, from the news side, which is a um, something that in the print era we was a little more clear because you were in the news part of the newspaper and then you would flip into the sections that, that would be marked very clearly as opinion. And now we have these atomized pieces that get spread all around and they might say opinion on them and they usually do, but are people really looking at that? Are they really understanding the difference? And um, how does that contaminate their idea when they read news? Uh, because they've read something that's very clearly coming from a politically motivated place in the same newspaper or news organization's platform that they're then expected to read something very factual that tells them, you know, the vaccine's safe for you. And they get confused about what's politically motivated and what's commercially motivated and what's not. And so all of that is, is you know, just agreeing with your diagnosis of the problem, but you asked, you know, sort of what works. And I think we're still in the very early days. So I would say since 2016, the awareness of mis- and disinformation as a problem has just sort of surged, right? We've seen, because we've seen the sort of stark consequences, whether it's the pandemic and people not getting vaccinated, or it's the outcome of elections and how people trust or don't trust them. Uh, those stakes are just getting extremely high. But, you know, obviously this problem has been around since information has been around. Um, but the scale of it and the scope of it and what's possible online is really um, extraordinary. And uh, a couple of things that have come about from my reporting. So I, I did a little bit of digging into a couple of cases in Maine where politicians who were spreading lies about election fraud walked back their statements. And, you know, that sounds like a very low bar, like they, they corrected the record after spreading lies. And tried to understand why that had happened. And part of it has to do with sort of physical uh, geographic communities where there's a sort of local ground truthing of reality. And um, where that's possible, that can actually be a way of combating mis- and disinformation. And what makes me, you know, it's small and marginal to say like, okay, if there's a community of trust and if someone you know can go and check out whether that, that claim is true or false, and then you can hear from that person you know um, that can actually be a source, right, of, of ground truthing and correcting a lie or correcting mis- and disinformation. And that doesn't sound very, um, I guess it doesn't sound very potent or powerful when you look at those sort of driving forces of algorithmic spreading of lies and sort of how that propagates online. But I think we also have to remember that we've been in a reality since early 2020 where people are very disconnected from physical contact and geographic content. And that's beginning to change again now, right? Like people are coming back out of their shells and gathering again, you know, fears of new variants and flu season and RSV and COVID notwithstanding, people are in more proximity to each other. And I think that that's a really good trend uh, based on what I've discovered about the communities that have been able to do things like walk back these lies or put sort of the brakes on these lies uh, because we need to be gathering in space with people. And for that matter, we know that that's good in terms of um, polarization, right? Like being exposed to people who think differently than us in real time and real space, not just seeing their diatribes that they post on Facebook. You know, I mean, there's so much to unpack there and we're all going to be unpacking all of this for a long time. And it's probably going to get 
significantly more problematic, particularly with um, you know facial AI being able to create uh, digital imagery that looks real and isn't, and that will be difficult unless you have the tools to tell you know whether Biden or Macron or she actually said what they appear to be saying visually and look like they're saying, and you know from all intents and purposes looks identical to them saying it, except it's actually an AI program generating them saying it. And we, you know, we're beginning to grapple with that too, right? Which is how do you tell those things apart, let alone the sponsored content issues that you mentioned. And, you know, even that's, it's hardly distinguishable in a lot of magazines if anyone reads them physically. And if you look on a, even if you look on CNN's page, there's a, from our sponsors or the, you know, there's something there that you could easily miss if you're not really attuned to it. I want to get into something a little wonky for a moment. Um, I'm on the board of PEN America and, you know, we've, we've done some studies of these, these issues as well, but that there is a more than semantic difference between misinformation and disinformation, you know, misinformation being incorrect, but, but not necessarily willfully or politically motivated incorrect. And then disinformation, which is the purposeful spreading of wrong information, false lies for political and or other purposes. And I think there's an over tendency at times in a partisan climate to label misinformation, disinformation, meaning we, we don't necessarily allow for, uh, I don't know what the word would be, like good faith propagation of incorrect information, uh, yeah. and particularly when it's a partisan thing. And I, like, so I wonder if you've thought about that at all when you've looked into this and 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 even to the point where you know, we had this a lot in COVID where in the rush for kind of certainty about outcomes, you'd have a lot of journalists who were not familiar with like reading scientific papers and then editors who wanted a good headline. And so you'd get a headline saying 60% of COVID patients do X, you know, whatever X was. And it's based, it was based on one non peer reviewed early print scientific survey of 180 people. So it was like 90 you know, 90 people out of 170 in one scientific study, but then the information became 60% are X. I mean, that's a small example. So I mean, what, what do you do with all that? Yeah, and it's, it's such an important distinction. It's why I said there's a real spectrum here from like the person who just innocently shares something that they believe to be true, right, on a face, like shares a Facebook post to someone who like deliberately propagates it. So just like an easy way to distinguish, right, is a lie versus just spreading innocently spreading a falsehood and i think there's actually a lot more leverage point with points with the people who are good faith actors right so um there's the opportunity to create more skepticism uh of of sources and more sort of like cross checking and ways of of looking at the underlying motivations of the sites where you're where you're looking at a deep fake or where you're looking at a a claim and for journalists you know the training um, that's necessary to parse the claims that are out there is so critical. And I think your point about the way the coverage of COVID-19 unfolded uh, is really important. You know, I've been a science journalist basically for my whole career. I've worked at this intersection of science and communication for 20 some years. And the value that people <laughs> recognize now after COVID in having journalists and arbiters who can really ask the rig rigorous questions, like, is this study peer reviewed? Is this a meta analysis or is this one study with a small sample size? How do we know what we know? How is the, how does the scientist making this claim? And also um, what portion of this policy is about the evidence base and what portion of this policy is about politics? Like that's a really important question to ask because that bears on, you know, the question of whether there should be mask mandates or whether there should be closures or social distancing and politics and science, right, like go hand in hand. And this idea that we just make decisions purely based on science is sort of like it, it just doesn't happen, right? We make decisions based on values that happens in our individual lives, it happens in our politics. And so, and, and frankly, it should be that way, right? We're always balancing evidence and information and science with other kinds of objectives. Uh, but really being able to understand that and scrutinize that for people so they can really understand the basis of decisions and make their own decisions and judgments, whether that's holding leaders accountable, voting people out or in, um, is so critical. And so 
I think that it is it is important to think about these as different problems. I think where you have like vectors of true disinformation, those bad faith actors, right? There's where you need sort of like policy, whether that's internal policy within these social media platforms to tamp down their lies or to prevent them from being able to go viral, right? To put the, some friction between them and sort of a mass audience. Um, of course, it's hard when people are political leaders or sports stars and they're spreading things that are outright lies. It's really hard to do that, um, but there needs to be some friction. But then then there's sort of like the innocence and in with with which we're all coming to information online, which I think the pendulum is starting to swing away. So I think, right, if you think about like the internet and what the promise of the internet was supposed to be and this free forum for people to express themselves and people being able to hear from the young protesters in Tahrir Square during the Arab Spring and being able to hear from the Iranian women now who are casting off the hijab or you know anywhere around the world. If you think about the kinds of information and stories we've been able to get because of the internet and because of the ways people can post things online in an unfiltered way, there's been a beauty to that. And there has been a lot of truth amidst uh, other kinds of information and hate and lies and all the things we know are also out there. and. I think there's an innocence with which we as audiences have all come to the internet and to these platforms, right? We know the people we connected with on Facebook in the early days. They were all people who were first person known to us, sharing information about their lives, posting pictures and recipes, um, showing us their family photos from the holidays. And now, right, like there's this kind of recognition that that trusted environment, that innocence we came to these places with is not it's not serving us, right? And there's a growing awareness of that. It's too small now, but I think we're going to get to a place where the pendulum is going to swing towards people just approaching this information with greater skepticism the way you would if you were like walking by a crazy person on soap soapbox in the middle of the street and, and like, you know, you would just be like, okay, what are you saying exactly? Like, do I buy any of this? Or are you just like a crazy person? You know, like, I think we need to be able to come to these sources with a little bit more of that skepticism um, and a little bit less of the innocence. Yeah, we're, we're older now and hopefully starting to get wiser. Um, you know, and to pick up on this like pendulum swing uh, visualization, which I like a lot, like a lot and, and to pick up on another topic that uh, you've dealt with for quite some time. And it's another topic that, you know, is very close into the science and communication intersection. That's climate. And, you know, you did a piece relatively recently uh, in The Globe about how you felt like you finally started to see the politics pendulum start to swing positively for climate in the U.S. Um, some time has passed since that article came out. Do you still feel that way? You're still feeling positive about the politics in the U.S. changing from, you know, our heels are really dug in into finally money is flowing and action is happening? Absolutely. I mean, Emma, I feel in some ways it's not just optimism about the politics and the policy. So this is a pretty seminal piece of legislation uh, for anyone who hasn't gotten into the details and geeked out on this yet. I mean, this is really the most significant piece of climate legislation in, in U.S. history. It's, you know, kind of by the numbers, $374 billion in investment in zero carbon and low carbon technologies, innovation for resilience, electric vehicles, heat pumps, like all kinds of sort of groundbreaking technologies. And, and from an approach that is actually a bit agnostic about what specifically those technologies should be. So driving innovation in a way that is really broad based to say that to be open ended about the possibilities of innovation that could create alternative uh, sources of fuel, alternative sources of energy efficiency. And all of that is extremely promising. And, and in fact, I think we're, we're almost not optimistic enough about what this legislation can do. I mean, there was a report that came out from Credit Suisse, the investment bank, that showed that um, while the sort of literal amount of money in this bill uh, dedicated to, to tax credits and investments of these kinds for clean energy, and climate friendly technologies is, you know, around that order of 374 billion, that uh, a lot of those tax credits aren't actually capped. So the potential for them as, as the engine of the economy gets going on these technologies, as there's more investments and more companies and startups flooding the space, more talent going into this, there's so many talented people getting involved in climate entrepreneurship in different ways that that is going to, uh, that could potentially be something more on the order of $800 billion of investment, of federal investment in climate technology. So I'm very optimistic about that. And yes, the project problem is getting worse. Um, yes, we have more heat waves, floods, uh, 
you know, fires and droughts and the costs of that are only growing exponentially year to year. Climate disaster is very real and we are seeing its impacts all around the world. But political and social change are nonlinear. And um, we are seeing something happen now, I think a tipping point um, with this legislation and with the momentum it's going to generate in the economy, um, not just the momentum it's generating politically, uh, that I think um, can do a lot. I think it can accomplish a lot in terms of cutting emissions. And the question is always going to be, is it going to be fast enough? Is it far enough fast enough? Because we're always racing against the clock with this problem. Although, I mean, it does remain indicative of the world that we're in in the United States that the most significant climate funding bill ever was called the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. I mean, I was trying to think like of a parallel what if the Civil Rights Act had been called the, uh, you know, Free Commerce and 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 uh, Car Driving Act of 1964? I mean, it would have been true, right? But it 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 because it would have led to some degree of civil rights, or you know, the Clean Air Act would be the the uh, the 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 Patio and Picnic Act of uh, 1973. I mean, it is it is odd that that's the title we gave it, right? I mean, Absolutely. that was the climate at the. I mean, it's Orwellian that this is how we name things and that this is how our politics works. And for that matter, that no single Republican in either House of Congress uh, voted to support this bill when climate change, you know, it's not as if the representatives of people in Florida, you know, those Republican representatives should be all for this, right? You know, think of the real estate, think of the lives that are threatened by each of these hurricanes. There's no reason why this should be a partisan issue. And yet somehow our politics is so broken on this and a number of other issues that it is. So I'm not trying to cast that in a light where I'm saying that now our politics is just totally great on this issue and we're being real about what we're actually doing, right? The fact that you have to Trojan horse these things with these strange names that have nothing to do with their, what they're actually accomplishing uh, is not exciting. It's not great. It's in, not in the interest of truth and sort of... Um, reality-based governing, uh, but the outcome of this bill and what I think it can do in terms of creating economic engines for addressing climate change is not to be underestimated. And I think I get a little bit concerned that people who are worried about environmental um, disaster, of which I am one and have been for a very long time, are, are unable to accept progress. And I think it's really important within the context of movements and efforts to change policy um, that you take the wins and you build momentum with the wins because you're going to build a broader base of people who are committed to change when you are willing to acknowledge that there's progress and use that as a way to um, create hope and create momentum. Yeah, I mean, I like that you highlight that because that's obviously central to what sort of underpins the progress network and what we're trying to inject as a diff different sensibility into these discussions and climate, you know, perhaps because there is now some real funding, not just around a regulatory regime, but around a like doing something regime, right? A lot of this bill is about building and making things. It's not just about attempting to regulate your way into a better future, which I know that's a subject of an entirely other conversation, but there are some really good arguments about, you know, you can't, you can't like regulate your way into future change and growth. That doesn't mean it's not, it doesn't have a place. So I want to end with a question to kind of link these two. There is the the climate science and what we currently know about the realities of warming and the realities of, of the impact of human behavior. And then there's also just a lot we don't know about the future because it's a vastly complicated multivariant system. So we have lots of probabilities and fears and, and hopes and projections about how all these things might go 10, 20, 30 years out and the uh, international climate panels try to collate vast amounts of global research and come up with probabilities. The way in which a lot of that gets then translated into both media and then policy is much more reductive, right? The, the science tends to be spectrums of probabilities and possibilities, but then the political discussion ends up being, if we don't do something about this right now, 100% different tomorrow, we're all going to be underwater in 20 years. And that's one of the probability pathways, right? But it's in a, in a spectrum. How do you, in a sense, how do you combat the, the, 
the political tendencies of misinformation, meaning distorting the unknown to force unknown for, for, for perfectly legitimate political purposes, while also being advocates or also trying to highlight what's an issue? It's such a great question, Zach. And I've been thinking about this too, with respect to COVID-19, where, you know, the simplicity of the messaging, right? You wanting to give people clear guidance on whether you need to mask or not mask indoors, you know, those sorts of things. Uh, we lose a lot of nuance. And the fact that the science is changing, right? We are constantly learning new things. That's particularly true in an emerging crisis like a pandemic, but it's also true in the climate. We're learning new things all the time. Um, we have a general sense of what we're facing. People, political messaging, and for that matter, a lot of media messaging, I think you're right, is reductive and simplistic. And we presume that people can't deal well with nuance and complexity. And that might I, I, I'm not sh entirely sure that uh, that approach to things is the best way because I think it becomes self-fulfilling. If we assume that people can't deal with nuance, they can't, they won't be able to deal with nuance because we're constantly giving them sort of black and white and um, dichotomous choices and sort of binaries. And, and then when we tell them that things have shifted or changed or emerged, they're confused and they say, you know, why is this changed? We we thought coffee was bad for us yesterday, and now you're saying coffee is good for us. And it's like, well, the evidence base has changed. And, you know, so I don't know that there's a clear answer to your question, except that I think we need to grapple more with nuance. I think we're losing a lot of nuance in our political conversations and in our media conversations. And, um, but we need to do that in a way that is easy enough for people to grab onto what they can do, because I think people will, will despair at the presence of complexity and the absence of any agency. So they need clear steps they can take how to what to vote for. Should they vote to, you know, make renewable more possible at the local level or with their public utility boards? How should they do things? Um, but also not to have things totally dumbed down um, and oversimplified so that you lose trust, right? So if you tell people, that the pandemic is over and it's not over, you're going to lose trust, right? If you tell people that the world is going to end after certain degrees of warming and then it doesn't end, you're going to lose trust, right? So I think it's important to have deadlines. It's important to have clear mandates about actions. It's important to drive people towards targets, right? Like it was important to do that for the countries with the 1.5 degree C warming over pre-industrial levels. But you don't want to oversimplify the message and say, you know, if we don't miss this, like if, if we don't get here, you know, the world ends or we've completely failed. And I and I fear that that kind of messaging has taken over in a lot of these areas of complex science and particularly with climate change and that it will it, it has an effect. Right. That people will give up instead of keep going, recognizing that every degree that we prevent of warming really is going to matter. I love that line. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to shamelessly steal it if I remember it about people will despair of complexity in the absence of agency, which I think is such a well put way of, you know, it's, it's not that most humans can't handle nuance given that we've been trying to learn that with pretty sophisticated brains for thousands of years. It's, it's the feeling of, uh, you know, what do I do with this? And even that it can sometimes be a more nuanced answer, the what do I do with it, but, it, but there have to be some answers. So thank you for that. And thank you for the conversation. You've been a really acute voice and I look forward to continuing to follow what you do and listen to what you say. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for the great questions. It's been loving, lovely talking to you, both of you. Thank cool. you, Bina. So Emma, as I said at the end, I do love the degree to which uh, Bina, first of all, it's interesting to talk to somebody who's been both a gatekeeper and someone who's tried to and successfully maneuver through those gates. Often, I mean, this is a bit inside baseball in the media world, but often editors and producers are editors and producers and writers are writers or people on air are on air. That, that, oddly enough, these are not professions that necessarily go together and to have someone who's aware of 
both what it is to try to get your voice heard through elite outlets that have gatekeepers and also having been on the other side of it, like that's in and of itself very valuable to listen to. But her perspective of, hey, wait a minute, you know, the, the, the need for binary, simple black and whites can often be really counterproductive, and really destructive in a world where there's not a whole lot of black and whites. I mean, there's some, if I drink a lot of a, a bleach, I'm probably going to die. But <laughs> if I jump off a building, I'm probably not going to fly. If I love the people around me, my life will probably be richer for it. You know, those are things that are generally true. Other than that, I think there's there's a lot fewer black and whites than we think. Yeah, and I'm particularly glad that she brought up the specific example of the 1.5 degrees Celsius warming target because I think she's absolutely correct that that simplification of that target has led to a lot of despair because on the one hand, you have a reality where at this point, I'm not saying that the unexpected can't happen, but it's probably delusional to think that we're going to hit, you know, 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2030 or 2050 or um, whatever we want to do. Uh, probably not going to happen. And people do have this viewpoint that if we hit 1.5, like game over. I, I know I had a view somewhat like that before two or three years ago um, when I started to look into what more people in the climate arena were saying for this particular job. And that's when I was like, oh, 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 wait a second. I didn't even realize that the Paris Agreement said 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius was an open target and that, you know, it would be better to have 1.5. But if we get to 1.6, like that's still manageable. It's just like we're trying to, like Bina said, the the lower, the better. But I really don't think that that has filtered into a lay understanding of climate at all. And I think it leads exactly that leads to a lot of the despair and anxiety. And look, you know, the nuance view would say uh, any system, any equilibrium has a tipping point. But we don't know exactly what that tipping point is. We know that it exists. It, these debates used to be had, and this is obviously less of an existential issue, but it certainly used to be had and continues to be had. And now that I'm saying this, we'll be had a lot next year with the Republicans in control of the House about what what level of debt and public spending will lead the system to implode or tip over. And that's an open question, right? We know there is an endpoint, like that a system can only sustain so much imbalance. But frankly, in most of these systems, particularly when they're fluid, particularly when they're subject to lots of inputs and lots of human decisions, identifying that output is really hard. It's not like a science experiment where we know at what point water boils under certain atmospheric conditions, because we've been able to run those experiments enough times that we can say, oh yes, at this temperature, at these atmospheric conditions, water boils. But most of life isn't a closed scientific system where you get to run thousands of experiments and identify the actual tipping point. So things like 1.5 or an attempt to sort of plant your flag or stick a finger in the wind and hope that you're <laughs> loosely defining some point in the not too distant future where you think there's going to be a critical shift, but without then acknowledging that that's what you're doing, right? There's no, there's no hard and fast scientific reality about future outcomes that we have yet to experience. Except for the fact that I'm sure we could say that 20 or 30 degrees Celsius of climate change would be a would be a problem even for anyone who wants to say maybe not. <laughs> yeah, and I think that the other problem that's come along with with not clearly communicating and then understanding that uncertainty is then like a lot of moral righteousness. You know, like there, there's definitely this whole thing out there about being a good environmentalist or like being a good climate change person, you know, try drinking with a plastic straw these days, you're going to get the hairy eyeball in Greece for sure. I don't know about the US, <laughs> but um, uh, I think the, the interesting question there is like, Yes, the journalists have a responsibility, but only journalists can really solve that problem. And then what's the responsibility that people have as uh, consumers of the news? And I'm not sure if I have the answer. But... Maybe we should just rename the progress and we can call it the, the nuance network. Yeah. The uncertainty <laughs> network. That would really work. That, that's a <laughs> rebranding not exercise. So on that note, let's talk about the news of the week for our final well, not our final look in 2023, but our final 
roundup in this way in 2022. We're not even in 2023. I'm, I'm, I'm jumping Leaping ahead. ahead. <laughs> you're, you're excited to get to the new year. So we're going to start with a quick positive climate one. Um, I did pick this because it's about Greece and there's lots of negative news about Greece all the time, the news and almost nothing positive. But since we were talking to Bina about uh, climate, uh, good news from Greece, renewable energy sources accounted for 47% of Greece's electricity generation for the first 10 months of 2022. Um, and that surpassed the share of fossil fuels for the first time. Um, was, that, was that wind mostly? Or wind and solar. Wind and solar. Yeah. So it certainly wasn't water. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, it's funny because renewables are definitely controversial in Greece. There's a, a, a lot of pushback against wind turbines um, in particular. But I wanted to highlight it as well because when we talk about climate, we tend to talk about the same countries over and over and over again. Um, and, and the pushback against wind turbines is the same as it, it is in a lot of countries, that people don't want them nearby, they don't want the noise, they don't want the view. They don't want the view, particularly in Greece, because we are so proud of our you know, beautiful natural view. Um, and then there's a decent amount of incorrect information out there about how wind tur turbines alter the migratory patterns of birds and alter the ecosystem. In recent years, a number of groups have been spreading misinformation, mostly in Facebook groups and local county commission meetings or town council meetings. Michael Thomas would know. As a journalist specializing in climate and energy, he joined 40 Facebook groups that oppose clean energy to examine what's going on. So there is a legitimate reason for some people not to want a wind turbine down the block or, uh, you know, a solar farm down the block. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I think uh, there, are, there are a lot of valid reasons to oppose a project in your community. Problem is, Thomas says many of the reasons clean energy supporters are turning into opponents are often not based on valid information. I mean, it might alter the migratory patterns of humans about which view they look at on which island but i don't know about the birds yeah you know, i don't know the birds are going oh man we used to fly over there it was such a pretty view of the bay and now it's all <laughs> no because of the because of the um oh it's you know, the air currents the, being created. Yeah. oh right yeah <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah it's not an aesthetic yeah. thing yeah, no I, but I the that. other the human objection is an aesthetic one and i think it's a little bit like to be honest, I've been on islands where you can see uh, wind turbines out, you know, on the mountains, and it kind of looks kind of cool. Like, I don't know, it makes yeah, me I, feel like we're in the tech future. I agree. I find wind turbines str strangely, like hypnotically, oddly <laughs> appealing compared to so many other things. I mean, they're way better than a like a belching smoke factory. Although mm -hmm. I guess it's all in the eye of the beholder. There used to be a, a line 20 years ago when China was dealing with pollution and they're still dealing with it, but they were really, really confronting their first wave of industrial pollution. And uh, the apocryphal story is like, you know, a younger Chinese man is riding a train with a tycoon, a business tycoon, and he's despairing about the fact that the air is, it's all smoggy and he can't see the mountains. And he says something to the older tycoon about it. And the tycoon says, what are you talking about? I look out the window and I see progress. Mm. And, you know, until you stop seeing that as, until you stop seeing pollution as progress and see it as pollution, it, it, I feel the same way a little bit about, you know, until you stop seeing wind turbines as an environmental, like aesthetic blight and see them instead as a key to the future, your, your optic is going to be very different. Oh, I guess they could say the same to us, but we'll leave that for. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> another conversation. So next uh, piece of news apropos uh, for our discussion with Bina about the media landscape. This is not a piece of good news. It's actually a piece of bad news. Um, but we're bringing it up because I think a lot of people feel like you mentioned, you know, the fire hose of information coming at journalists in the beginning of the episode. Uh, people reading the news and watching and listening to the news also feel like it's a fire hose of information. And it's particularly a fire hose of negative information. And they've actually done research for the first time. This research was just published uh, in Al Jazeera from three researchers in New Zealand, um, studied the headlines in the US over the last 20 years, 2000 and 2019. They actually are more negative. They actually do carry more fear, anger, and disgust. Um, so it's not just in your head, guys. Uh, it has now been shown that it is a worse media landscape in terms of negativity. 
And this is where I think social media is a contributing factor. And as you know, I've been repetitive and I suppose somewhat stubborn in my saying that we ought to look at the positives of social media and the degree to which it still is connective tissue. And I, I believe that and we use social media all the time as the vital tools for the progress network and for ideas that we think are more constructive to enter the ether. These are the channels through which you do so. But the financial imperatives of social media in terms of both attention seeking and attention grabbing absolutely privilege, you know, fear, outrage, touching those kind of hot emotion buttons because they are much more immediate buttons and that's what works in an immediacy world. So it's not surprising that that skew is now evident in terms of headlines. And it's funny, you see that skew most in terms of headlines in that often those headlines, I've certainly experienced this on the, the writing end of it. It's very hard to come up with a catchy headline that does justice to, as Bina talked about, a nuanced piece. And often a headline is way, way more reductive and extreme than the resulting piece is. But the headline's what grabs attention. And it's it, it grabs attention in that you don't even need people to read the piece at a commercial level, right? You need them to click onto the headline, but you don't really need them to read the piece, which right. is kind of sad but true. Yeah, I should say also in defense of headline writers everywhere having written headlines myself, it's difficult and it is really hard. You know, sometimes you just want to say like, here's a really long and interesting piece about culture and religion and you should read it, but like you can't put that out there, obviously. So, um, you know, like take Pina your medicine. Are, yeah, just it's good. I swear. Just give me five minutes. Like Pina said, there's financial incentives for journalism outlets as well. So, um, before we move on into the next piece, I'm also going to add probably the question that people are thinking about when it comes to the negative headlines. Whose fault is it, right-leaning media or left-leaning media? They said that the rise of headlines with fear and a decrease of emotionally neutral headlines is both right-leaning and left-leaning media, but in particular, right-leaning outlets tend to use headlines conveying more anger. So, I wonder if left-leaning convey more fear, but either way headlines with more fear and less emotionally emotional neutrality is on both sides right leaning media in particular has more anger so, good to know there you go and uh, a couple of state wins before we sign off a few months ago maryland made the news for announcing that the administration of the governor would eliminate the requirement of a four-year degree for a lot of state jobs and at this point, they've hired almost 2,000 people without four-year degrees into uh, various postings. Governor Larry Hogan announced a new protocol for hiring state employees that could affect thousands of those looking for a job. The first state in the nation to formally eliminate the four-year college degree requirement uh, from thousands of state jobs. Which is amazing. Um, we're now seeing that start to pop up around the country as a discussion, um, especially since college is so inordinately expensive. So that's one piece. And the one that's related to that is that the Hedginger report just announced that they're expecting colleges to drop their prices in 2024 significantly, and that they have studied the pace of the rate of increase of tuition, and it's finally started to slow down especially in relation to inflation, prices have actually dropped already. So I bet it's going to be a long time before that piece of reality percolates into any degree of popular consciousness. Again, back to your headline, there is unlikely to be a double bold headline, you know, college costs decrease X percent. I mean, it might be a news item, but it is unlikely to be front and centered and featured because crises subsiding are never news the way crises escalating are. That's just the way it goes. Yeah. And I think it's this one is particularly going to be particularly pernicious because even with a big cut, the price of college in the US is still so expensive that it's kind of like, 
eh, well, it's, you know, it's still an issue, which is why, you know, I think applauding what Maryland has done and hopefully other places. Um, there are some big companies doing that too. Google and Delta are opening up jobs uh, to folks without a four-year degree, which I think is such a smart move because you're wasting so much talent there. Absolutely. Last but not least, um, a little piece from the midterms that we missed, but is very interesting. New Mexico, using some COVID relief funds, had a pilot program for free child care for certain families who met income requirements. For New Mexico families are now eligible for free child care. The governor today announced the program expansion, now allowing free care for families earning up to $111,000 a year. That's for a family of four. That basically doubles the earning level required and means 30,000 more families qualify starting May 1st. Those COVID relief funds ran out, but the program was so popular that New Mexico voters decided to enshrine funding for child care into the state constitution, which is really neat. Another sort of neat fact about that is that they were able to balance the budget for the state for that using um, oil and gas revenue. So. There you go. Well, there you go. <laughs> a Free child care. Story. States, states is a laboratory of democracy. Mm -hmm. And with that, we are at the end of our 2022 season. We will resume full bore in early 2023, although we will probably do some bonus episodes and some content in the interim. I want to thank all of you who are listening now and have been listening all along for paying attention, digesting, thinking. And I want to ask all of you who are to take some of the sentiments that we're trying to put out there about less fear, less outrage, more focus on what's working, more focus on what we're doing to create problems that human beings have admittedly created, and see what you can do in your own lives to spread that sensibility in terms of conversations, in terms of workplaces, in terms of general, more critical, in the best sense of the word, reading of news, uh, in that it's up to all of us to shift the culture, to change the sensibility, to move the needle, all those cliches. And I'm going to assume that if you're listening to us and have been, you're probably intrigued by that and may share it. And back to Bina's comment about agency and complexity you know we all have agency here and i hope we all use it for the best effect into 2023 and beyond and thank you emma for having these conversations with me thank you zachary and uh wishing everyone happy holidays and a great end of 2022 and a great start into 2023